Hello and welcome to News Central Now. My name is Mazino Appeal. The top stories this hour. Nigerian Army details soldiers over death of 16-year-old boy in Kaduna. Plato State Government relaxes curfew on just Bukuru Metropolis. And heavy rains kill 17 in your 170 in north of Khartoum, Sudan. Details shortly. Welcome once again. The Nigerian army has detailed, uh, detained a soldier for allegedly killing a 16-year-old boy, Ishmael Mohammed, while attempting to stop hoodlums from causing mayhem in Sumaru, Zaria, Kaduna State on Tuesday. The Director of Army Public Relations, Onye Manwachuku, released a statement on Wednesday in Abuja detailing the incident. Wanchuku said troops received a distress call at about a large gathering of hoodlums in the uh, Samuru area of Zaria. The hoodlums were reportedly burning tires and pelting stones at security personnel. Wanchuku said in response, the troops mobilized immediately, arriving at the scene to disperse the mob and enforce the curfew imposed by the state government. In our own country, and of course they took advantage by using the psychology of those uh, children, uh, knowing fully that here in northern Nigeria our people are close to our neighboring countries like uh, Niger, and of course they have been able to use their psychology, making them to believe that uh, what happened in Niger can happen in Nigeria, what happened in Burkina Faso can happen in Nigeria, what happened in Mali. The outcome of the governor's inspection will determine if the 24-hour curfew imposed by the government will be eased. In Kaduna State for News Central, I'm Emmanuel Bagudu. Now, the Plato State Government has relaxed the 24-hour curfew previously imposed on Jos Bukuru Metropolis. Effective from Wednesday, August 7th, 2024, residents can now move freely between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. daily until further notice. In a statement signed by the Director of Press and Public Affairs, Gyang Bere, Governor Caleb Manasse Muftuang announced the relaxation after consulting with security agencies. He praised these agencies for their diligence and commitment to ensuring strict compliance with the curfew. The governor urged residents of the Joss Bukuru metropolis to cooperate with security personnel and report any suspicious activities promptly. He assured the public of the government's unwavering commitment to the safety and well-being of all citizens. The governor also commended the residents for their patriotism in observing the curfew, noting that their cooperation is vital for the collective interests of the state. Now joining us to discuss this is Commissioner for Information, Plato State, Musa Shoms. Mr. Musa, you're welcome. Good to join us here. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Now, sir, if you will, please can you give us a detailed timeline of the curfew relaxation, including the dates and times when the restrictions were eased? Um, first of all, we want to say we're grateful to God Almighty for this day that we didn't lose our people because of the wickedness of certain individuals, a minor minority who wanted to take advantage of a protest that was tagged peaceful. You will recall that um, on Sunday in the evening, we saw charlatans, miscreants, hoodlums going to tell people that they must close their shops to join them in the protest on Monday. So what, relying on intelligence, the governor imposed a 24-hour curfew on Josbukuru Metropolis. Even with the curfew in place, we saw where miscreants came out with their clubs, with machetes, with sticks, and other dangerous weapons. But to God be the glory, the situation was curtailed by security agencies. And after being advised by security agencies, the government decided to relax the curfew from 2 p.m., to 6 p.m., pending on the intelligence we'll get afterwards to see whether we will further relax it or even lift it up entirely. So basically, as it stands, the curfew starts from 2 p.m. and ends at 6 p.m. in the interim. Okay, uh, Plato said is not one that is um, a stranger to these kinds of instances, so the authorities must be well adept how to handle it. So if you could please give us some security measures that have been put in place to ensure the public safety of the Josh uh, Burukutu metropolis following the curfew Bukuru, relaxation. Bukuru. Josh Bukuru. Yes, um, you, like like you, you said, it's, it's right and it's wrong. We, we, you know, sometimes we get... Um, 
bad publicity for these things. And the proactivism of this government has um, had um, said a lot of um, things right. If not, we would have been gnashing our teeth or counting our losses. Because if you saw the way the dangerous um, munitions these young chaps were wielding, you will know that they were up for something. Just like you saw the governor of Kaduna speak about the age brackets of these um, perpetrators, on the blood tweet is not um, far from it. Yesterday, about 26 persons were arraigned by the Nigerian police. Amongst them are minors, some are 12, some 14, some 15. They'll be taken to the young people's home for remand, while those of them that are adults, 18 and above, will be taken to Just Correctional Center. As we speak, we've had other arrests. With um, The police will be parading or arraigning about 25 more, and the number outweighs this number. But sometimes because of logistics and other issues, you cannot arrest everyone that has defiled the curfew, everyone that has um, taken up arms against the state. You will see that some persons that do not have never been to the airport, have never seen a plane fly before, having waving and hoisting flags that other than that of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. As a government, the first step we took was the imposition of curfew on the George Bukru metropolis to curtail further occurrences because um, if we had allowed these things to go on the usual way, we would have been counting our losses, CZ would have been reporting a carnage or, or some um, break of law in, on order on the black two. You know, it's their fundamental right to protest. The Constitution, Section 40 of the 1999 Constitution as amended, gives our people the right to have peaceful assembly and association. So as a government, we didn't score through that right. You know, our governor is a renowned lawyer. And some people wanted to take advantage of it. People came from different states to come and unleash mayhem on the plateau. If not for the quick and apt intervention by government and security agencies, would have been saying a different story now. And um, we want to thank the peace-loving plateau people that have helped in keeping the peace and maintaining it. We want to thank the security agencies for their proactivism. We want to also thank um, the clergy, community leaders, those that have been have been clamoring for peaceful coexistence, those have been preaching that we live and let's live. For those who are having years of um, anarchy, we want to call them to order. Government will not fold its arms and watch them unleash mayhem on peace and patriotic um, citizens. That will not happen under the watch of His Excellency, but it's the killer man as he moved on. Yes, we have a gentleman as a governor, but the responsibility of safeguarding its citizens is one of the key things that this government and places premium on. And we want to say thank you to Black people once again for their peaceful disposition. Our demonstration was used as a positive example. Then these rascals of epidemic proportion decided to change the narrative. And that is not us. That is why you've seen that we have not had any carnage lately. And we're hoping that this positive momentum will, will be sustained. Well, Mr. Ashams, thank you very much. We do hope that the positive momentum is sustained from now on. Thank you for joining us on the news today. Thank you for having me. God bless Plateau State. You're welcome. Now, a journalist was harassed by thugs on Wednesday while covering the NBAT governance protest in Port Harcourt River State. Reports say a group of thugs stationed themselves directly across the federal secretariat, intimidating and driving away both journalists and protesters. Witnesses claim that two protesters were assaulted while police officers on the scene took no action. The thugs reportedly stated their, in, uh, stated their intent to prevent any protest activities from occurring that day. And Nigeria's service chiefs and the Inspector General of Police have pledged to resist any unlawful change of government amid the end bad governance protest. In a security briefing in Abuja, they pledged to defend the nation's democracy. Chief of Defense Staff Christopher Musa said the military and security agencies are targeting those advocating an undemocratic government change. Chief of Army Staff Tao Reed Lagwaja also emphasized the Army's commitment to deploying resources to combat the riots sparked by the protest to ensure peace. In his remark, Chief of Naval Staff Imano Ogala assured continued collaboration with other security agencies for maritime security. On behalf of the officers and soldiers of the Nigerian Army, state unequivocally that the Nigerian Army stand assured in 
defense of our democracy, of our peace, of our harmony. And we are not going to shift ground on that. The Nigerian army will not sit by and watch the nation slide into anarchy. Accordingly, the truth of the Nigerian army will continue to work in conjunction with other security agencies in the population space to maintain law and order. On our part, the armed forces of Nigeria, we've been doing all that we need to do to ensure that we provide the enabling environment to support Mr. President and this government in the attainment of this objective of reducing poverty and hardship in this country. Particularly the Nigerian Navy, we have been working assiduously towards addressing the issue of insecurity in our maritime environment, and this has so far been paying positive, uh, really positive results, leading to the uh, increase in our oil production, which is the mainstay of our economy. It's very clear to all that the protests have been hijacked by criminal elements and other groups that do not mean well for the country. I want to remind all Nigerians that while it is a constitutional right to participate in peaceful protest, it is also an offense and a crime to engage in disorder, violence, and chaos. Let's go on a short break now when we get back. More news on the other side. And you're welcome back. Now, following the disappearance of protesters from the streets of Abuja, fuel queues have once again reappeared. Some motorists have expressed displeasure over the fuel situation, hoping for a return to normalcy. Our correspondent, Joshua Imari, brings us this report. Unfortunately, we're unable to bring that report to you now. Perhaps we'll bring that at a later date. However, joining us to discuss the issues atta uh, attached to the protests in African affairs is African affairs analyst Alester Wilcox. Alester, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Good afternoon for having me. It's, it's my pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, Alester, now what were the main factors, you think, driving the recent hunger protests in Nigeria? And... How have these factors evolved over time, if they've changed at all? Well, um, sincerely, if you ask me, I would think that um, I see, in this particular protest, I see more of um, politics playing than uh, the real issues we have in, on ground. Um, I know blue word that, like everybody has said, everybody's have a right, the democratic government able to complain at any point in time. And I see more of politics playing out, but that is not to say the fact that there are no legitimate reasons why people should protest as to what is happening. And I have said and said clearly, if you want to protest, there must be the issues and then the end point, what are we expected to come out of the protest? But sincerely, I do not see uh, any synergy between what you are protesting for and what your end uh, solution it's, uh, it's uh, what solution you're looking at for. You know, I have not seen any articulated uh, 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 plan to that extent. All I see is some various groups having their own point agenda, point of demand, which for me uh, does not make much of a, a, a corporate sense as to if there has to be an engagement, what are we engaging and how are we, what are the processes to get those things resolved. I think for me, it's uh, it's more of a political protest, uh, protest than a legitimate uh, uh, um, economic protest. Okay, so demands uh, and resolutions aside, uh, how have you seen the Nigerian government and the security forces' response to the protests? How do you think this has affected the way people see um, the government? Um, like I said, um, I don't want to give past mark or fail, failure to 
either parties. But I think there were a lot of uh, restraint because the government recognized the fact that everybody have a right to protest. The government also recognized the fact that they have a responsibility to maintain law and order even when people are protesting. So while the government tried as much as they can to appeal to the protesters or to the organizers not to protest, they also made room for there to be peaceful protests without, uh, uh, without infringing on the rights of other people. Remember, there's no right that's absolute in our constitution. Where your own rights end, that's where my own rights stand. So if you have a right to protest, I also have a right not to protest. And if you, you are protesting, your protest must not, should not infringe on my own rights not to protest and to, uh, to go about my own legitimate uh, businesses. So I think the government tried to balance that act even though they don't want the protest. No government wants protest, so they try to dissuade the protesters and also uh, try to maintain a balance between the protesters and non-protesters. So I will, I, I, will, I will commend them on that, but you can see what happens thereafter. We are in some part, where the politics is at play, we are in some part of the country, the protest went wild. And today, you just, I just had you interviewed your, somebody from JOS, in person plus to state, we saw what happened there, we saw what happened in Kano, we saw what happened in Kaduna, we saw what happened in Brunu State that everybody that is the picking of uh, a point of reference as of for, as far as good governance is concerned in Nigeria. We use Brunu State as a point of reference. Yes, there was violent protest in Brunu State. So that goes to underscore that it is beyond economic reasons why people are protesting. Because I mean, look at what happened in Jos, look at what happened in Kano, Kaduna. Is that economic? I mean, to the point of begin to hoist a foreign nation flag and begin to call for military intervention. So that has been... So I think the government has the responsibility to maintain law and order while guaranteeing the right of every individual to either protest or not to protest. So I would, I would just leave it at that, that there was an equilibrium in responses. Yes, there have been news with governors telling about the amount of loss that they have experienced during this process. But let's look at the world wave of protests currently. There's so many protests going on, especially here in Africa. We've had the Kenyan instance. Um, we've also had Bangladesh recently, uh, which resulted in the PM resigning and the army, if I'm not mistaken, um, filling in that vacuum for the meantime. Taking a look at Nigeria and the protests currently, let's talk about the consequences of these protests for the Nigerian social cohesion and also the stability, especially in terms of intergroup relations and trust in institutions. What's your thought on that? Sadly, and very sadly, Nigeria is not a united country. Very sadly, uh, Nigeria is a united country. So Nigeria cannot present a united front in terms of making a demand as to what they want to do or what they, want, they don't want to do. So there cannot be that cohesion like we saw in Bangladesh or that we saw in Kenya or in other parts of the country. Because the, the, that position might not just be there. So Nigerian joining, I mean, doing that line would be more destructive than achieving the purpose. Now look at the Bangladesh case. The purpose was very clear. And they were not mixing up with any other thing. They said repeal a certain law that gives rights, 30% of jobs to certain people. And they all went out for it. All everybody that was affected went out for it. Nobody said, I am Northern Bangladesh, I'm Eastern Bangladesh, I'm West Southern. Everybody went for it. And they achieved results. So, but in Nigeria, like I just said, I remember NSAS, the North didn't protest at NSAS. The North didn't protest. But the South did. Now, this, this current pro, uh, uh, protest, the South, the South is still that look, they didn't even lift up a finger, rather they were dancing and they, and they either uh, 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 casting as passion on everybody. The Southwest did not, apart from Lagos, but the North became very, very hot. So that shows that there's no cohesion. So if there is, for us to mean is to have any meaningful protest, it must be something that comes across every region and it doesn't so right now it creates it creates more more mistrust because tomorrow now they will say the north is protesting because uh, a northerner was not the president like it was when NSAS came because it was a northerner so the north did not participate now the story will have been will be because a southern president that is why they didn't pass that's why the south did not participate and so 
how long are we going to continue in this trajectory of north south divide so uh, as far as i'm concerned we are not a nation and we are not working hard to be a nation and that's one of my pain uh so protests like this will have that sectional coloration religious coloration it will not achieve the main point and the worst aspect of it is that most of the promoters of this protest or these agitations are all foreign based they will be they are based abroad they are not at home they will be abroad and instigating people i mean to do certain things at home for instance i'm not sure somebody in nigeria will have proposed that people in and people in canada and canada should and carry russian flag how much is coming is coming is coming from nigeria it's not something from nigeria that will have made that proposition so it might be somebody that is abroad remoting things in nigeria that will say go and start carrying russian flag so we are not a united country so we can never have united no matter how noble the idea is no matter how noble the subject is we can never have a united protest rather it will be this sectional protest and sectional interest political interest and at any point it will fizzle out i think we need a better approach in holding our government accountable yes government needs to be held accountable and when i say government to be held, i'm not talking about the prior government alone i'm talking about all tiers of government must be held accountable to deliver to the people what the people rightly deserve to be delivered to and that is when we can make a better progress you can protest in your local government you can protest in your state you can protest in your state in your local government that is when protest will be effective you know what is wrong in the local government you can protest there even if one delete the the chairman to go you can protest until the chairman leaves so All this right, is, that, is where, that is so you don't just start you just move to the federal when you are not solving the local problem and we're not united to have a federal kind of uh, protest that can cut across everybody and achieve well, the same result well, it, it, well, won't well, happen, it, it, it won't well, happen now yes well thank you mr wilcox you've said plenty and your input is well noted thank you very much for joining us on this afternoon's news thank you it's always my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, let's also tell you that we understand that members of the House of Representatives have yet to implement their resolution to reduce their salaries by 50% for the next six months. This resolution passed on July 18 was expected to take effect with the lawmakers' July paychecks. The pledge was made during a debate on a motion amid at uh, preventing a nationwide hunger protest that began on August 1st. However, the House of Representatives spokesman Ruti Miyaki has cited bureaucratic delays as the cause of the holdup. In an interview with Punch newspaper, Aki explained that, the delay, uh, explained that the delay is due to necessary administrative procedures and coordination with financial institutions, he said. Now, Rivers Governor Siminalai Fubara announced significant achievements in the reconstructing, uh, reconstruction, equipping, and also staffing of health facilities during his tenure, leading to more accessible health care services across all levels in the state. He attributed these successes to the last six months of his administration following the resolution of a political crisis. Fubara made the remark at the inauguration of the pressure swing as absorption. Uh, uh, Pressure swing absorption oxygen plant, I beg your pardon, at the General Hospital in Ogalin community, LMA local government area. The plant, a public-private initiative, was built through a partnership involving UNICEF, the Nigerian government, the River State government, the Canadian government, and IHS Towers. What it means to have this pressure swing plant, something that will create great oxygen, generated oxygen, knowing fully well that majority of our people today, if there is one illness, it's respiratory illness. That is one of the things that are killing people. It's associated with cardiac. Am I lying? Why is it so? Because of this pollution. And we are in an environment of pollution. So please, Chairman, and the leaders and the traditional leadership, royal fathers of Elena, buy into this project, secure it. It's not a mistake that it came to your own place. Other people are also looking for it. This is a powerful plant that will come and uh, give an answer to the needs 
of the health sector in terms of saving lives of children who suffer from pneumonia but also from other respiratory diseases. It will save the life as well of newborns, mainly those newborns who have a very low birth uh, weight. Nigeria's educational system is a dynamic one that provides vast opportunities. Now, although some argue otherwise, educators and young entrepreneurs are driving change in their ways. New Central's Chidima Honor has more on this. Creating an environment for easy learning is a top priority for collective and personal growth. In Nigeria, tertiary institutions are championing ways to enhance learning for undergraduates which is spread across every sector of the country. Changing the way we train to increase the issue of case studies and experiential learning. Um, have we done all that we need to do? Yeah, not all. We can always improve. But we've started. But you know, before you see the blossoming of it, it will take time. We're setting up an innovation hub on campus that will be helping our students across the STEM disciplines and the other um, business disciplines, art disciplines on campus to come together and come um, up with all sorts of innovative solutions to some of the problems that plague us as a society. And to better equip themselves, some Nigerians have taken to learning other beneficial skills. While some engage in craft skills, others believe that tech remains a sustainable way to both gain more knowledge and earn a living. The Nigerian government needs to start, you know, bringing up tech events, you know, to assist the youth right here in Nigeria and, um, you, know, you know, to just motivate us and also assist us, basically. And to, to me personally, I feel like we need to start investing more in, um, investing more, I mean, in terms of capital right here in Nigeria into this um, tech world. I think these skills are very, very important to every young person out there. There's something you can do, trust me. There's something everybody can, can try their hands on. There's always something. It can be soft skills, just soft skills can put food on your table. Like whatever thing that we fetch money or just bring you extra income, I think every young person should try their hands on them. As a challenge of lack of accessibility to learning remains in some part of the country, Others who are opportune are making the most of it. In Lagos for New Central, Chidima Ona. And fashion enthusiasts have called on young Nigerians to tap into opportunities available in the men's fashion industry. This was as they spoke to newsmen in Abuja on preparations ahead of the upcoming Men's Fashion Week, saying that the event will provide opportunities for different caterers of art lovers, artisans and enthusiasts in the fashion and arts industry. Amadin Uyi reports. According to available data, revenue in the men's apparel market worldwide in 2024 amounted to about $573.5 billion. While the market is projected to experience an annual growth rate of about 2.9% between 2024 and 2028, fashion enthusiasts say, this presents a viable market for young entrepreneurs on the African continent. If you look at how fashion has evolved, first and foremost, you would also agree that men's fashion has also evolved tremendously. Uh, if you also look at the cost involved in purchasing women's wear, it is almost three times that of men's wear. It's almost the same equal opportunities that uh, designers who do uh, women's wear will get. While enthusiasts also say the market in Africa remains yet untapped, they say the upcoming men's fashion week in Abuja, expected to hold in August, will help reposition the fashion and arts industry in Nigeria and create a platform that will promote creativity. Uh, beyond the runway, uh, the annual event provides a physical platform that's gradually repositioning fashion as a useful tool for commerce and creativity in Nigeria. They also add that the event will create an opportunity for those in the fashion and arts industry to earn and empower themselves. It's all about empowering young people across Nigeria and beyond uh, through Af other African countries. The goal is to be able to build capacity for the younger generation 
teach them the business of fashion in partnership with our own, the, the, uh, the Q Concept, the organizers of Men's Fashion Week. We will be showcasing, we will be having master classes. The, the goal for us, for young people, is empowerment. Like Mr. Biola have said, empowerment basically. So when you have about 50 models, you have about um, uh, approximately 10 makeup arts. So at the end of the day, backstage is already, we are already counting over 80 jobs that have been provided in a space of one week. While all attention will be geared towards the upcoming Men's Fashion Week in Abuja, enthusiasts are hoping that Africa can soon be earning revenues, like its counterparts in the U.S., leading with almost $111 billion in 2024 alone. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadin Uyi. Coming up. Heavy rains kill 17, injure 170 in northern Sudan. We'll bring you details after the break. And you're welcome back. Niger says it is cutting diplomatic ties with Ukraine with immediate effect, causing Kiev to uh, Kiev of uh, accusing Kiev of supporting terrorist groups, it says, two days after Mali took a similar step. The decision to break relations with Ukraine comes in the wake of heavy losses suffered by the Malian army in late July at the hands of jihadists and separatist forces, which they blamed in part on Ukraine. Niger government spokesman Amadou Abdurrahman said Niger would ask the UN Security Council to debate what the, what he described as Ukraine's aggression. Niger and Mali are both run by military governments that took power in recent coups, went on to rip, the, uh, rip up the defense agreements with France and turn to Russia for military help. Now, a delegation from Russia, uh, nuclear giant Rosatom, is on a four-day visit to Burkina Faso to discuss the construction of a power plant that could significantly enhance electrification in the West African state. The governments of Russia and Burkina Faso have strengthened ties since Captain Ibrahim Touare's military regime seized power in a September 2022 coup. In October of the same year, they signed an agreement to construct a nuclear power plant. Burkinabe Minister of Energy Yakub Goba said the Rosatom delegation's visit aims to discuss the technical aspects and establish the necessary prerequisites for implementing and commencing construction. Rosatom's chief engineer, Alexander Renev, also emphasized that the facility's location will take into account security concerns in a country plagued by terrorist violence. And heavy rains have triggered building collapses in Sudan's River Nile state, resulting in the deaths of 17 people in a small town located approximately 400 kilometers north of Khartoum. This disaster occurred as Sudan grapples with nearly 16 months of fighting between rival security forces. According to the state's infrastructure minister, Samer Saad, around 11,500 homes have already collapsed, and at least 107 people have been injured. Every August, the peak flow on the Nile, coupled with torrential rains, devastating homes, wrecking uh, infrastructure, and also claimed livestock, both directly and indirectly through waterborne diseases. This year's impact is expected to be even more severe due to over 12 months of conflict, which has pushed millions of displaced people into flood-prone areas. Now, three men have been jailed for taking part in violent disorder in the riots in Merseyside, Liverpool. A 58-year-old man who attacked a police officer is given three years, while two others received sentences of 30 months and 20 months. The regional prosecutor outside court said anyone participating in violent disorder will be swiftly punished. Meanwhile, thousands of police are preparing for more possible riots across England later, with reports as many as 100 protests could be planned. This order erupted last week after the fatal stabbing of three girls in Southport with unrest fueled by misinformation online. Now for more on this, I'm joined by our international correspondent, Afwa Hagen. Afwa, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. 
Good. Now, please, if you will tell us what the latest on the riots in the UK is currently now. Well, last night was comparatively peaceful, I suppose, than the two nights before. We did have a couple of flashpoints. There was a young boy who was attacked in Belfast, that's in Northern Ireland, uh, and then police were using dispersal orders in Liverpool and Durham, where we had some um, unrest as well. So 37 people were ordered to leave the city centre in light of intelligence of planned rioting and planned disorder. Now, that was last night. Tonight, we could have a completely different story. There are 100 or more potential gatherings planned for today. Now, I've been talking to people, working my sources today, and it sounds like it could be more than 100 gatherings planned. There's lists going around on social media. Some of them contain the wrong information to try and distract people. And whilst I've been out and about earlier on today, what I'm seeing is shops being boarded up in preparation for the more than 100 potential gatherings that could happen this evening, more than 400 arrests have been made. 100 people have appeared in court, including those three people that you spoke about earlier on. Nearly 6,000 public order officers are out in force this evening. They are being deployed mostly across England, north and south of England, for this evening. An extra 500 prison places as well are being made available for the swift justice that seems to be coming down on the rioters who have been caught as part of this violence. I feel if you'd please um, tell us, uh, give us an update on the stabbing that started this riot and exactly why the riot started taking a turn where uh, uh, migrants and migrant facilities started getting attacked. And that's a very good point. What happened last Monday in Southport was this tragic stabbing of three young girls that were a Taylor Swift themed dance class. Uh, and what happened after that was misinformation was put on social media. Now, this misinformation came from Russian bots who basically put on social media that the perpetrator of this stabbing incident uh, had a Muslim name and was a Muslim immigrant. There was even a picture of just a random person that that was put on social media as well. Now, this was, was spread by far-right antagonists, including the English Defence League, the EDL, which are a far-right organisation here in the United Kingdom, and that was spread on social media. So then this anger started that uh, Muslims were responsible for the attack in Southport, which we now know is categorically false. However, because this rioting has started, you now have people who have jumped on the bandwagon and are making this not necessarily about what happened in Southport, not even about what happened in Southport. They are using it as an opportunity to riot, to loot shops, to drink, to take drugs and to cause this disorder on our streets. Now, a lot of, them, a lot of it is underlined by this anti-immigration, racist, fascist, sentiment. And a lot of it is underlined by usually white men who are just out for a jolly and want to riot on the streets of England. And how is this affecting local communities and uh, in the roundabout way, the sentiment across the country? <laughs> Yeah, and it is affecting local communities. Like I took a walk um, earlier on and talked to some community leaders and basically what they are saying is number one, that they are afraid and number two, that this is affecting local businesses and local high streets. So shops are boarding up earlier um, around where I live and in other areas of London because they are afraid of what could happen to their businesses when the riots happen this evening. People are afraid. There's a real sense of fear and it's palpable across England and especially in communities of ethnic minorities and Muslim communities. So this is having a real long lasting and deep effect on communities up and down England particularly. Well, I forgot, thank you very much. Good of you to join us here today. Tobia Musa began her quest for a podium finish in the 100 meters women hurdles event by winning her heat in a time of 12.49 seconds and qualifying for the semi-finals.
Amusa, who is the current world record holder, was quicker than USA's Alicia Johnson in second with 12.61 seconds and Janique Brown in 12.84 seconds in Heat 1. The time means Amusa fi finished as the second overall fastest qualifier behind defending Olympic champion Puerto Rico Jasmine Camacho Quinn. Nigeria is yet to win a medal at this year's Olympics. The women's 100 meters hurdles semi final is billed for Friday, 9th August 2024. Now, despite seeing their gold medal dreams dashed, Egypt and Morocco will be looking to cap their remarkable Olympic men's football campaigns with their first ever podium finish when they meet in the bronze medal clash in Nates on Thursday. Both teams have been outstanding during the Paris Games as Egypt progressed as Group C winners before reaching their first semi-final in 60 years. Morocco, who topped Group B, reached the knockout stage for the first time. Egypt lost to host France 3-1 in extra time of semi-finals, but now have their sights set on a first Olympic medal. In the other semi-final, Morocco lost 2-1 to Tokyo silver medalist Spain. The North Africa Derby is scheduled for 4 p.m. Nigerian time. And that's all the news we have for you this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of the major stories. Nigerian army has detained soldiers over death of 16-year-old boy in Kaduna. Plato state government has relaxed curfew on just Bukuru metropolis. And we also told you that heavy rains have killed 17 and injured 170 in north of Khartoum, Sudan. You can send your eyewitness reports to the WhatsApp number on your screens now. And do follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live on DSTV Channel 422, Star Times Channel 274, Able TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Mazino Appeal.